Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 13, part 1, Structures of the Heart. So, as you can see, the heart has quite a few name structures on it, and we'll be covering many of those in this lecture. To start with, though, the heart is located near the midline of the thoracic cavity. And if you remember right, this area is referred to as the mediastinum. It's located between the two lungs, which are in their own pleural cavities, and it's technically in its own little cavity called the pericardium cavity. Now, the cool thing about the location of the heart is it's between two very hard, rigid structures, the vertebral column and the sternum. And because of this, uh, people are able to use what's called CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, when someone's heart stops. And the whole point of the CPR is to help keep oxygenated blood circulating in the body. And here's just another picture of a heart in a cadaver. And this is the thoracic cavity opened up. And you see that if you just take off the top of the thoracic cavity, you don't see the heart itself. What you're looking at is the pericardium, the rough fibrous connective tissue that surrounds the heart to help protect it. And this pericardium is composed of two principal portions. First is the fibrous pericardium, which, like I said, is tough, dense, irregular connective tissue that helps protect the uh, heart from rougher parts of the body surrounding it. And below that is the serous pericardium, which is fluid-filled. It is a double membranous layer that surrounds most of the heart. And as I'm sure you remember, serous membranes have the outer layer referred to as the parietal layer, and then the inner layer that runs along the organ is referred to as the visceral layer. And of course, because of the hard beating of the heart, this helps protect it from the constant rubbing it's going to have against the surrounding structures. So here's another image to remind you how a serous membrane works. If you imagine a serous membrane as a water balloon and you push the heart into it, then you see how you get a double layer surrounding the heart. Now we're going to move on to the layers of the heart wall itself. So the heart wall has three principal layers. The outer layer is the epicardium, and this is the external uh, layer of the heart wall, and it consists of the visceral layer of the serous membrane, as well as tissues that lie on the surface of the heart, fibroelastic connective tissue and fatty tissue like adipose tissue. So here, so remember that the pericardium has both layers of the serous membrane, and the epicardium has the visceral layer of the serous membrane. Below that, or deep to that, is the myocardium, which is the basic muscle of the heart. It is very thick and is cardiac muscle tissue. And then deep to that is the endocardium, which is a thin layer of endothelium and some connective tissue. And this is to help minimize friction inside the heart chambers. Uh, after all, each time the heart beats, it's being beaten against by thousands and thousands of blood cells. And here's just a picture of a, an actual heart. You can sort of see the endocardium in there, slightly different in color from the myocardium or heart muscle tissue. And then lying on the very outside is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, which is referred to now as the epicardium, as well as some fatty tissue. So the heart has four chambers. It has a right atrium, a right ventricle, a left atrium, and a left ventricle. Looking on the surface of the heart, you also see that there are these two flap-like structures associated with the atrium. And this is, these are called the auricles. They are patch-like structures, and they basically increase the overall volume of each atria um, slightly. Then, looking along the surface of the heart, you sort of can see that there are grooves along the heart. And these grooves actually mark the external boundaries of the heart chambers. So we have the coronary sulcus here that goes all the way around and basically shows the separation between the atrium and the uh, ventricles. And then you have the anterior interventricular sulcus that separates, shows the separation between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and then on the back there's the posterior interventricular sulcus. 
And within these sulcuses, uh, you're going to find things like blood vessels, fatty tissue, and so forth. Now, if we look at the right atrium itself, we see that it has three main openings allowing blood to flow in. It has the opening to the superior vena cava, which is a large vein. It has an opening for the inferior vena cava, the other main large vein of the body. And then it also has a little opening for the coronary sinus, which is another vein that actually is coming from uh, around the heart. It also has what's called the fossa ovialis, which is a um, depression found in the intraatrial septum, so the wall between the two atria. And this was once an opening that existed between the two atrium back when uh, we were an embryo, but it's since closed up, and so now it's only a depression. And of course, you have at the bottom of the right atrium the tricuspid valve, which also could be called the right atrioventricular valve which is where the blood flows into the right ventricle when the, after the right atrium contracts. Also within the uh, right atrium, you see these pectinate muscles that basically are on the outer wall of the um, atrium. Now we've got the right ventricle. The right ventricle obviously starts with the tricuspid valve, where blood enters it from the right atrium. You also see that attached to the flaps of the tricuspid valve are these uh, connective tissue structures referred to as cordy tendini, and they are attached themselves to these papillary muscles that are uh, connected to the right ventricle's walls. And basically these help in making sure the tricuspid valve functions properly. Uh, also found uh, in the right ventricle is the interventricular septum, which is the wall that separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle. And along these w walls of the uh, right ventricle are these structures referred to as the trabeculi carnii, which are basically um, where some of the um, bulging of the muscles of the heart. And then finally, you have the pulmonary valve. When the right ventricle contracts, this is where the blood leaves the right ventricle to then enter, enter the pulmonary trunk, which is an artery. So the pulmonary trunk is an artery, and it's going to send heart, uh, blood away from the heart and toward the lungs, where the blood will then get uh, oxygenated and then returned through the pulmonary veins to dun, 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 the left atrium. The left atrium has many similar structures to the right atrium. Um, however, instead of, uh, however, its openings for veins are for the left and right pulmonary veins, where blood is going to enter the right uh, left atrium. You will see the fossa ovalis within the interarterial septum. Again, the septum is between the two atria. And then, of course, there will also be pectinate muscles on the outer surface of the uh, left atrium's chamber. Here you'll then have a bicuspid valve, or the left atrioventricular valve, so that when the left atrium contracts, it'll send blood into the left ventricle. So now when we look at the left ventricle, we see that it obviously has the bicuspid valve where blood enters it, nice oxygenated blood. Um, you see structures that you expect. You see the cordy tendony, that is the connective tissues attached to the papillary muscle and the bicuspid valve's flaps. You see the trabeculi carnii uh, along the surface, inside surface of the ventricle, as well as the interventricular septum. And when the left ventricle contracts, it'll send blood through the aortic valve into the ascending aorta, the largest artery in the human body. Also notice this additional structure um, outside of the heart called the ligamentum arteriosum. And it goes between the uh, aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Now back when we were uh, embryos and fetuses, this actually was a blood vessel that connected the two uh, larger blood vessels. But now that uh, after you're born, that then just turns into a uh, bit of connective tissue. So it's sort of a leftover structure from when we were an embryo or fetus. And the whole point of that and the hole between the atria is basically because our 
um, flow of blood when we were embryos and fetuses were different because at the time we weren't breathing, so we weren't actually oxygenating the blood in the lungs. All right, uh, circulation in an adult, though, or after we're born, basically goes like this. It starts, say, with the right atrium's deoxygenated blood, it goes through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary trunk and arteries, up into the lungs to get oxygenated. Uh, then the pulmonary veins return the blood to the left atrium that goes to the bicuspid valve to the left ventricle. Left ventricle then sends the blood to the aortic valve into the aorta and basically through all the blood vessels in the bulk of our body until finally that blood returns to deoxygenated to the right atrium via the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. So our circulation of our cardiovascular system is, well, a giant circle. Now, you'll notice that the left ventricle is much thicker in muscle tissue than the right ventricle. And this is because the left ventricle has to send blood throughout the entire body. And so it needs to pump harder than the right ventricle, which is only sending it to the lungs. Now, if you remove the two atria and look down into the heart, you see that what's referred to as the fiber skeleton of the heart. And this is composed mainly of these four dense connective rings that are around the valves and are also attached to each other by dense connective tissue. And this basically provides an attachment site for the heart valves themselves. It helps to prevent these valves from then overstretching. It also is a point of insertion for the cardiac muscle bundle, so all the muscle uh, cardiac fibers can then attach to the fiber skeleton to allow for the contracting of the heart. And it also prevents direct spread of mm, the action potential as the heart signaling its own contractions. And here also you can see pretty clearly how the bicuspid valve has two flaps, while the tricuspid valve has three flaps. And it turns out that when these uh, valves are open, blood can flow easily into them from the atria. However, when the ventricle starts to contract itself and the blood starts to push back up, it'll actually cause the flaps to close. And instead of having them flip back into the atria, causing blood to flow back into the atrium, um, the cardinae tendini are actually able to prevent that from happening so that blood is not backflowing. With the semilunar valves, or the ones in the uh, aortic valve and the um, pulmonary valve, uh, they have these little pockets that are shaped sort of like crescent moons. And so in this case, uh, when the ventricles contract, blood is pushed through into the veins. But when the contraction stops and the blood starts to backflow, it's unable to get into the ventricles because these cusps fill up, blocking the way back into the heart. Now, you can have some valve disorders. You can have stenosis, which is a narrowing of the heart valve. Uh, this can be caused from mitral stenosis, from, say, a star, uh, scar formation or a congenital defect, and this can, if serious, uh, be corrected by surgery. You can also have insufficiency of the valve, where it, the valve fails to close completely. This leads to backflowing into the other parts of the heart, which it makes the blood uh, flow any insufficient. And mitral insufficiency, uh, for example, is the backflow of blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium. And again, these things can be corrected if they are shown to cause serious problems by surgery. And that's it for this portion of the uh, lecture.